It was exactly one year ago today that Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 vanished with 239 people on board. No trace of the Boeing 777 has ever been found, but we are now learning about a situation with the plane's underwater locator beacon, a problem that may have severely hindered the search for the doomed jetliner. David Piper joins us now from Bangkok, Thailand with more. David? Hi, Arthur. Yes, this uh, interim report by investigators does give a lot of details about the missing aircraft, but it doesn't offer anything to explain what happened to it. Now, MH370 went missing about an hour into its flight from the Malaysian capital Kuala Lumpur to Beijing a year ago. Investigators believe it finally ended up in the southern Indian Ocean, but no trace of the plane has yet been found. The report goes into fine detail about the flight, its crew, and its maintenance record. The the only thing it highlights as not right is that the battery powering the underwater locator tracker on the aircraft expired a year before the plane went missing. Aviation experts say the batteries do last a long time and could have still been working during the flight, but it would likely mean they didn't last long as expected if the plane was on the ocean floor. The head of the investigation that produced the report has defended its findings. The sole objective of the investigation of an accident or incident shall be prevention of future accidents or incidents. It is not the purpose of this activity to apportion blame or liability. Families who had loved ones on board the aircraft gathered in a park Sunday in Kuala Lumpur to mark the first anniversary of the plane's disappearance. Some have suggested the Malaysian authorities still know more than they are prepared to say, and they continue to urge that the search continues for the missing plane. As the NOK, I think hopefully they will still continue the search until to get a real or the exactly what we want. The Malaysian authorities have vowed to continue the search in the southern Indian Ocean. The Australian government has, though, questioned how long before they will have to scale back the search because of the cost involved. Both governments are at the moment sharing the cost of the search. It now amounts to some $40 million. Back to you, Arthur. Can't imagine how difficult it is on those families. David Piper, thank you so much. Eric? Arthur, despite the intense year-long search with nothing yet found, the cause of Flight 370's disappearance, of course, remains unanswered. So joining us now to set some, set some light on what certainly has turned into one of the biggest mysteries in aviation history, science and technology expert Oliver McGee. Uh, thank you for joining us, Oliver, today. What is your view on what most probably happened? Well, thank you for having me today, Eric. Uh, as I said on Hannity a year ago today, uh, there are two things missing here, the plane and patience. We're still missing a plane after a year but patience has been forced upon us. The preliminary report that was discussed just momentarily is really having one safety recommendation, and that is global flight tracking. This is coming from the International Civil Aviation Organization's preliminary findings and study on February 2 to 5, uh, 2015, uh, asking for global flight tracking. Right now, we track aircraft for about every 30 minutes in oceanic flights. Uh, they are probably going to be pushing back to do that tracking every 15 minutes, or even as low as 10 minutes. And this is good news because when we have, uh, since 1948, 80 oceanic uh, remote region aircraft that have been lost, we've only found three, um, this MH370 is bringing forth how we really need to get to some of these technologies. Yeah, that's unbelievable when you say they've been, you know, 80. I mean, the, the vast distances in the South Indian Ocean, they're just unbelievable. They've, they've scoured oh. about 40%. 23,000 square miles, meaning they got 46,000 square miles to go. But let me point to one thing about that report. A lot of, lot of speculation over the pilot, uh, whether he was a rogue pilot, Zaire Ahmed Saw. Of course, he had that simulator in his home that you see behind him. They investigated whether or not he practiced disappearing. There were concerns over his political orientation and involvement. He was seen in a, in, in a photo wearing a shirt called Democracy Dead, which was against the Malaysian authorities. But here's what that report said, part of it, saying, quote, today, there was no significant changes in his lifestyle, interpersonal conflict, or family stresses. No behavioral signs of social isolation, change in habits or interest, self-negligence, drug or alcohol abuse. So as an investigator, what do you take from that to try and piece this all together and try to see what exactly happened? 
Uh, Eric, um, the key word here is preliminary. Um, we're talking about very little information. Unlike Air France 447, uh, we have no black box, no idea what was going on inside that, that cockpit until we find out what those conversations were about. And <clears throat> until we know that, uh, everything is speculative. Nobody really knows anything. Uh, one of the things that we're finding in this report is, is, is scant. It's about five pages long because um, um, everyone is very, very afraid to really get into further speculation. This is very different than Air France 447's report, which was 128 pages long, and other reports that are much, much longer because there's more information available. And I think we're finding that uh, Malaysia Airlines and the Malaysian officials want to do the uh, adage, less is best, until we get the black box and find out really what were those conversations going. I guess going. that's a good point. They really don't really know anything. But what about the family members and others who say that they're they're holding back? That authorities, you know, we've heard all these uh, cockamamie theories about the plane, you know, flew off someplace and is being hidden in the jungle in a runway. You know, maybe. I mean, what do you think about that type of theory and what, and the, what the families are saying that they think the government are, is holding something back? Well, Sarah Bajak, who is largely the spokesman for the families that's expressing uh, some concern about the transparency and disclosure that's involved here. But you run into transparency and disclosure problems when you do not have the devices. But I do really, really want to emphasize that the families are saying uh, it's time for us to start focusing on the people more than the devices right now until we do get the device, which is the black box. And I think, believe patience since it's called for because we took two years to find Air France 447's black box, and we knew pretty much so the vicinity of where that plane landed in the mid Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Brazil. But in this case, we're looking across a big, large Indian Ocean, and so we are really trying to get to two thirds of that, that and do you, and do you think priority find, area. Do you think they'll eventually find it? Um, it's going to be a, a murky because, like I said in the uh, uh, data point of the 148, uh, air, uh, since 1948, uh, 80 aircraft have been lost. This is a very, very hard task. I, I say this is like Star Trek. We're going to where no man has gone before. And so we really need to be, the key thing is, is patience, due diligence, and steadfastness. The right. report, the, 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 the uh, travel, the, the search is going to take about to May, and then they're going to try to re release a final report a year from now. Okay, well, they still got 46,000 square miles, a huge expanse of the ocean to keep on searching. And as you said, Oliver McGee, patience. Thank you very much for Thank joining you. us today. Thank you for having me, Eric. Right.